I'm excited today to, to be your pastor like I am every Sunday, but especially today because I have an opportunity to actually be here but not be the one preaching. Usually when I'm not the one preaching, I'm not here, but today I'm really excited because we have a special guest. I got an opportunity to hear on Friday afternoon that we could um, have Vody Bauckham here preaching in our services, and I was excited to say yes. Now, if you don't know Dr. Bauckham, he, he started in my life by writing an apologetics book. It was called The Ever-Loving Truth, and a lot of my friends were reading it, and it makes a defense for the faith. That's what apologetics is, that be able to have an answer for whatever, uh, whatever the hope that you have so you can tell that to others. And then he branched off and started writing some books about the family and how the, the primary source of spiritual formation, which we believe, comes from the home. And in that book, he wrote a book called Family Driven Faith, which you want to read that, and also Family Shepherds, men being the shepherds at home. And dads, you don't want to forget the title of this book either. It's called What He Must Be to Marry My Daughter. Let me say that again. What he must be if he wants to marry my daughter. Basically a biblical apologetic for manhood. And for probably the book I'm the most excited about right now, which you're going to get to hear a little bit about, as I know from the first message, is a book on Joseph. It's called Joseph and the, Co or, and the Gospel of Many Colors. And if you've been here very long, you understand my passion for seeing the gospel, not only in the New Testament, but the gospel, how we can see that and preach that from the Old Testament, and so that's going to be a great book as well. So I'm super blessed and super excited, as you will be in a few minutes. Y'all give a tabernacle welcome to Dr. Vody Bauckham. Well, good morning. It is indeed a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you on today. Um, my wife is from the Dallas area and we're here from time to time and um, ended up uh, being here for a very uh, special family occasion and so glad to stop by here um, with you on our way back out. Um, my wife is here with me and she's back here on the back row with seven of our nine children and um, my sister-in-law is, <laughs> my, my sister-in-law is back there holding our, our newest edition uh, three-week-old Simeon. Um, so there, there's, there's my crew. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, would you open to Genesis 45? Genesis 45. And as we look at Genesis 45, you know that we're in the midst of uh, the, the life of Joseph. And when we look at the life of Joseph, we're generally looking at uh, Genesis 37 through 50, that last section there uh, in, in Genesis. And usually we think the apex of that story is in Genesis 41. Because we, you know, we, we read books and we watch movies. And, you know, most of us nowadays watch more movies than we do read books. But, you know, you know how, how a, a, a character arc is supposed to go, you know. Um, a character arc, you know, the, the, the hero of a story, the arc of his life doesn't just go, you know, straight up. You know, you're not just introduced to him and then things just get better and better and better and better, the end. Something has to happen. And so the character arc usually starts off and you're introduced to the character and things are going along and then some tragedy happens and the arc goes down like this. And then, you know, he has to sort of fight his way up and just when you think he's about to fight his way back up, something bad happens and he goes down probably worse than he was the first time. And now all of a sudden, you know, something happens and the story goes back up and it's kind of like, that's a typical character arc, you know, for a hero movie. Um, there's always, you know, the heroes going along and they're unassuming and something happens and life becomes terrible and then they have to fight their way back up and then something really bad happens and they go all the way back to the bottom and you know that eventually they're going to have to fight the villain and here's the villain and then the end of the thing is when they get the villain and the villain get what they deserve and we, that's the story, Right. And so if you follow that sort of character arc, we think that Genesis 41 is kind of a payoff. Genesis 41, when Joseph rises to prominence in Egypt. And so we generally teach it something like this. You know, in Sunday school, this is how we teach it. Now, boys and girls, you know, Joseph, he, he loved God and he served God and his brothers were jealous. 
And because they were jealous, they mistreated him. And then they mistreated him, and he was sold into slavery, and then he went to prison. But he was faithful to God, and because of his faithfulness, God promoted him, and he became the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And so the moral of the story is, be faithful to God, and he'll reward you. Wrong answer. That's not the message of the life of Joseph. Genesis 41 is not the apex in the life of Joseph. If we understand the book of Genesis and we understand the way that Moses has laid the book out, there are some clues that point us to a number of things. One, they point us to the fact that Genesis 41 is not the big payoff. And two, they point us to the fact that there's something much more significant in Joseph's life. There's a couple of ways that you could divide the book of Genesis. I think the most natural way is dividing it according to the Toledotes. Now, Toledot, that's just a Hebrew word for generations. But in Genesis, 11 times we see these are the generations of. We start with the generations of the heavens and the earth, and then the generations of Adam, and then the generations of Noah, and then the generations of Noah's sons, and then we have the generations of uh, Shem, and then there is Terah, and then Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Esau, and finally, in Genesis 37, these are the generations of Jacob. So the last division of the book comes in 37, and it says these are the generations of Jacob. Eleven times. It's the eleventh time we've seen these are the generations of. And it says these are the generations of Jacob, which means that the last section in the book of Genesis focuses on what character? Jacob. We want to say Joseph, but really it's about Jacob. And Moses tells us that. These are the generations of Jacob. Here's the story of Jacob's generations. Why is Jacob important? Well, there's three major elements that you follow throughout the entire book of Genesis. They are land, seed, and covenant. They, recur, they occur over and over and over again. You cannot understand the book of Genesis without understanding the concept of land and seed and covenant. And so in the beginning, what do we have? Well, we have God creating the heavens and the earth. And what does he do? He separates the land from the waters. And then how does everything produce and multiply according to its own kind and by seed? And then he has a covenant with the man that he places in the garden to keep the garden. Well, the man breaks the covenant. When he breaks the covenant, what happens? He is excluded from the garden, so he's kicked out of the land, this Garden of Eden. He's excluded from it. But there's also a promise that's made, a covenant, and this covenant involves a seed. Genesis 3.15, he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. So we have land, seed, and covenant all over again. Then we come to Noah, and what happens with Noah? Well, there's sin throughout the world, and God purges the earth or the land with the flood. But after he purges the land with the flood, before he purges the land with the flood, he takes the promised seed, because remember, Genesis 3.15 is about a promised seed. He takes the promised seed, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and we know that Shem's the promised seed. They go onto the ark so that the seed is protected as the land is purged. Afterwards, there is a rainbow in the sky. So God is making a covenant, and this rainbow is the sign of the covenant. I will not wipe you out that way again. It's amazing if, you, uh, if we have any bow hunters in here, you know that when you finish doing damage with your bow, you hang it upside down so that you don't destroy the tension in the string. God puts a bow hanging upside down to say, I have finished. So this covenant. Well, then we come again and we get Abraham. What happens with Abraham? There is a covenant. What does this covenant involve? Land and seed. Well, which seed? Any seed? Okay, great. Here's Ishmael. Wrong one. A seed, but not the seed. It's Isaac. Renew the covenant. And then Isaac has twins. Which one is it going to be? Esau the oldest? No. Jacob, the youngest. Now Jacob has 12 sons. Which one is it going to be? 
they have gathered the land or at least some of the land that God has promised to Abraham. The promised seed is carrying on. And they are still the people of the covenant. So now let's look and think about Genesis 41 again. Again, we're going to be dealing with Genesis 45. But I, I want to sort of disabuse you of this idea that Genesis 41 is really the apex of the Joseph story. Because it's not. So we get to this place in Genesis 41. And what happens in Genesis 41? Well, several times there is a reference to the land of Egypt. Huh. If you've been reading Genesis carefully... This theme of the land is very important, but Egypt is not the land of promise. In fact, throughout the rest of the Bible, Egypt comes to symbolize the place from which God's people need to be delivered. And it's a picture spiritually of the sin from which we need to be delivered. So is the payoff for a child of the covenant to be in the land of Egypt? Really? I don't think so. What does Pharaoh do? For Joseph, well, he puts this linen garment on him, which is akin to the garment that Jacob put on him. Whose garment should he be wearing? Pharaoh's or Jacob's? He should be wearing Jacob's. He says, you'll be over my whole household. Whose household should he be over? Pharaoh's or Jacob? He says, I'm going to give you a wife. And he gives him Potiphar, daughter of a priestess of, on, of, a priest of On. Interesting, just a few chapters earlier, we had this unforgettable scene where Abraham, the very old Abraham, says to his servant, come here, put your hand under my thigh and swear to me. And we remember that scene mainly because, you know, we're just going, I just, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> just trust me, man. I'm, I raise my right hand. I'm not putting it under your thigh. But we remember that. But what does he say to swear? Swear that you will not take a wife for my son from among these people. Remember that? His wife has to come from a certain people. Now, what's happening with Joseph? His wife is an Egyptian, and her father is a priest. Potiphar, his daughter is Asenath. Now he has pagan identity. Because his name has changed to Zaphonath Panea. That always amazes me. We look in Daniel and we see Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, Nazariah. Their names are changed. And we think, wow, that's terrible. They got to get out of there. We look at Genesis 41. Joseph's name is changed. And we say, hey, kids, hang in there. Maybe you can get this too. It just doesn't make sense. So if that's not the payoff. If that's not the apex of the story, then what is? Well, I think it's the end of 44 on into 45. We're going to look at chapter 45 to get today. And specifically, I want us to look at this issue of forgiveness. And I want to do a couple of things here. I want us to see this from a redemptive historic perspective. Because what we have here is the clearest picture, the clearest illustration of forgiveness in the entire Bible outside of the work of Christ. The other thing is, I want us to see the gospel here. Because there's an amazing thing. You have redemption and substitution and forgiveness all right here, end of 44, end of the first half of 45. It's all right there. The third thing is, from a practical perspective, this issue I believe, is the most significant issue for us to wrestle with as Christians. So first, let's look at the significance here. Joseph is overcome. The reason he's overcome is because of what happens just before. Just before, Judah has been identified as the head of the family. By the way, Judah is the promised seed. Not Joseph. Judah. Jesus is born in the line of Judah, not the line of Joseph. So Joseph's not the star of the story here. This is about Jacob, promised seed, and who's next? That's the question. Who's next in the line? Judah is next in the line. But Judah, as the promised seed, does something that overwhelms Joseph. Judah's the one who spoke up and said, hey, if we kill him, we don't get anything for him. Let's sell him. That's Judah. 
Judah's the one in chapter 38 who goes away on his own and marries a Canaanite woman. Judah's the one who falls into sexual sin. Judah's the one who is terrible. He is awful. And now he's the head of the family. Not only is he the head of the family, but he says to Joseph, not knowing that it's Joseph, remember when he threatens to take Benjamin? He's going to stay here because of what he stole. It was planted on him. Judah says, I have become surety for the boy. I have become a substitute for the boy. I told my father who loves the boy that I would put my life in the place of his so that my father could have the son whom he loves. Does that sound familiar? I give my life as a substitute so that my father can lavish his love upon this child that he loves? It does sound familiar, but you went too far. You're thinking about Judah's great, great, great son, Jesus. We're not there yet. I'm thinking about his great son, David. David is in the line of Judah. How does David come to the fore in Israel? There is a giant in a valley, and the giant says, send me a man to fight with me. If he defeats me, we will serve you. If I defeat him, you will serve me. So David, as a substitute representative of all of Israel, goes into the valley, fights and wins a battle on behalf of all of Israel who is in him, represented there in that valley. And in his victory in the valley, he wins victory on behalf of all of those who are in him. Put Judah and David together. And their greater son, Jesus, goes to a valley as a substitute for the sons whom the father loves, offers himself for their sins and defeats in that valley their collective foe, thereby winning victory on behalf of all of those who are in him. We see this in Genesis 44. Then we come to Genesis 45, which is this beautiful picture of forgiveness, which is what our salvation is all about. This is incredibly important. I told you it's incredibly important, number one, because of the way in which we understand the gospel. Secondly, because this is where the rubber meets the road. We live in relationship with one another. We live in relationships with our family. And then as Christians, God calls us into relationship with one another. We call ourselves brothers and sisters in Christ. It's another familial relationship. When you're in relationship with people, close relationship with people, you sin against each other. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. When you're in close relationship, amen belongs right there, y'all. I'm going to give you another chance. When you're in close relationship with other people, you sin against each other. Amen. Amen. I mean, we just do. We do. That's why Jesus talks so much about forgiveness. And, you know, I love it when Peter goes, man, I... How many times I got to forgive my brother? Tell me about all this forgiveness stuff. How many times? Because you know, you, you don't know, Jesus. You, you, don't, you, you don't know. How many times? Seven? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. Peter knows it's not a math equation. That number seven is the number of completeness or completion. You must forgive him completely. 70 times, which is a seven and a 10. 70 is a seven and a 10. So you got completion and perfection. How many times should I forgive him? Forgive him completely and perfectly, which means forever. You don't stop forgiving him because he won't stop sinning. (laughs) Amen? Amen? So there it is. There it is. We've got to do that because this is where we live every day. And when you're in relationship with people, you are either a forgiving person who is continually, continuing to wash the relationship in forgiveness or you don't forgive and you pile up unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment. Those are your only two choices. You're either constantly forgiving or you're constantly piling up bitterness. There is no in-between. 
Some people are constantly piling up bitterness and they, they just are bitter. They look bitter. Their face is like bitter. You just look at them. You go, that's a bitter person right there. That's actually healthier. It really is because at least then, you know, maybe somebody can look at him and say, you should look bitter. And that can, that can be helpful. You know who's really bad off? Those people who hide it so well. And they just stuff it down. And they're so pleasant and sweet, kind, and just bitter on the inside. You know that'll make you sick? Physically ill? Emotionally? It'll destroy you. And eventually it'll come out. Somebody you just snap. You're either a forgiving person or a bitter one. There's no other alternative. The other issue is forgiveness is commanded. Ephesians 4.32, I'll give you part of it because the other part we're going to talk about in a minute. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. It's a command. It's an imperative. You must forgive. Jesus even connects it to our relationship with God. Not just that we forgive because we're forgiven, but if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. What is that? Does it mean it's like the unpardonable sin or something? No, not exactly. But it's significant. It's not optional. It's commanded. The other reason this is so significant is because it shapes our understanding of our relationship with God. So if my understanding of what you do when people sin is you hold on to it, you don't forgive it, and you pile up bitterness toward that person, then guess what I think God does when I sin? Ding, 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 ding. The same thing. The same thing. And if my bitterness towards people makes me hold them at arm's length, guess what I believe God does toward me when I sin? Yeah, absolutely. And so you got people running around wondering about whether or not they're really saved, saying that they can't really feel or sense the presence of God, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with anything that God has done toward them. But their unforgiveness toward other people that they project onto God. Question then, what does forgiveness look like? I'm glad you asked. Genesis 45, beginning of verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before the, all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He didn't take it. He saw this Judah-Benjamin exchange, and he couldn't take it. Because remember, Judah's the one who was responsible for him being sold into slavery. Benjamin is the one who is the only other full sibling of his, the wife whom Jacob loved, who actually died when Benjamin was born. He favored these boys because of their mother. And remember, his first wife, Leah, he didn't even want her. Um, guess who guess who, son Judah was? Leah's. So now Judah, the son of the unwanted wife, offers himself as a pledge for Benjamin, the son of the wife whom his father loved. And Joseph is just unwanted. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. That's some crying, y'all. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. It just, 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 just messes them up. They, okay, this stuff is found in Benjamin's bag. It's over for us. All of us, we're dead. We're not going back home. This is it. We're done. And then, he said, nope, it's just Benjamin. Okay, Benjamin's done. And then daddy's going to be done. 
because, you know, we got rid of Joseph and that messed him up. And now Benjamin is the only one left from the wife that he loves. We come back without it. Matter of fact, we can't, no, we're dead because we can't go back home. We can't go back home. We can't go back home because if we go back home, dad's dead. So we just forget it. It's over. We're done. But Judah, Judah, you gonna, Judah, you going to do that? No, Judah's dead. And Judah's dead. We could go home then because, you know, we could take Benjamin and maybe we could survive. But still, Judah's dead. And then he says, I'm Joseph. I don't think they heard the next line. Is my father alive? They're still stuck on, I'm your brother Joseph. Can you imagine? They literally could not speak. You ever done something horribly wrong to someone? And then not face them for a while? And then they walk up unexpectedly? You ever been there? I mean, just think about it. You talk about somebody behind their back. And then they sort of walk in. You know how that feels. Don't act like you don't know how that feels. (laughs) You know how that feels. Multiply that. They didn't just talk about it behind his back. They sold him into slavery. And he says, oh, by the way, I'm Joseph. If they thought they were done before, because they went from we're all dead and then Benjamin's dead, which means if Benjamin's dead, we're all dead because dad's dead and we don't want dad to be dead. We're dead. Okay, Judah's dead. Or we're dead you know, now they're right back to, oh, dude, we're, we're, yeah, we're all dead. <laughs> so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Stop. We just exploded one of the major myths about forgiveness. And this myth needs to be exploded. It really does. Yeah, I mean, it just like, it needs nuclear treatment. This myth does. And that is the myth that forgiving requires forgetting. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Forgiveness does not require forgetting. It doesn't. I've had people come to me for counsel, you know, because I I just, I just feel like I'm not, I haven't forgiven and I don't know why I've tried. And what makes you think you haven't forgiven? Well, because it just keeps coming up and I just keep thinking about it and I just keep, so you remember it and therefore you feel like you haven't forgiven. Yes. You know, here's here's my pastoral counsel when people come to me with that. My pastoral counsel is, stop that. (laughs) Followed by, you know human beings weren't created to forget things? When human beings forget things, they are malfunctioning. (laughs) Amen. Some degenerative brain disease, a blow to the head. We, We weren't created to forget. That's ridiculous. So we beat ourselves up because we don't do something that God designed us not to be able to do. In the words of that Texas theologian, Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? (laughs) And then we lie to ourselves because something will come up and we go, oh, I've forgotten that. Newsflash, that's not how you respond to things you've forgotten. If you forgot something, you go, you don't go, oh, I've forgotten that. If you've forgotten something and somebody brings it up, you go, huh? (laughs) If you say, oh, I've forgotten that, Hmm? that, if you can say that, then that that means you remember the thing. Do you follow? You just lied. Wasn't even necessary because forgiving doesn't require forgetting. Well, were you supposed to forgive and forget? Was that like second hesitations? <laughs> That's not in the Bible, y'all. It's not in there. When you go home, go do a word search. Any translation you want and find forgive and forget. It's not there. In fact, it's more than not there. It ain't there. 
That's beyond it's not there. It ain't there. We're not required to forget. We remember. Here's what it means to forgive. Forgive. To forgive means that we choose not to punish. That's the simplest definition. My car's out here. You're leaving. You're distracted. You're running to my car. I come out there and I say, hey, 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 no problem. I forgive you for that. Just give me your address. Figure out how you can pay for it. I did not forgive because I'm making you pay. I come out there and I say, hey, don't worry about it. I forgive you. And then I go home and I take care of it out of my own means. That is forgiveness. It means literally to discharge the debt. That's what it means to forgive. It doesn't mean that I go home and I come out the next day and I go, hey, what happened to my car? <laughs> Do you see how ridiculous that is? This whole forgive and forget stuff, it's ridiculous. And it really would be funny if people weren't literally beating themselves up over it. Because you can't forget something that you should never forget in the first place. That's the beauty of forgiveness. I remember it, and I still forgive you. Look at the next part of this. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Here's the source of forgiveness. You have to have a broader theological understanding of what's going on. He says, God sent me here. By the way, here's the beauty of this too. The beauty of this, you know, you talk about you know, young theologians and young Bible students. Young Bible students are always trying to, you know, ah, you know, just I'm just really trying to, you know, figure out this, this tension between, you know, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man for his actions. And if God is sovereign, then how can we Joseph doesn't wrestle with that at all. Nor do I. He just says both things as though there's no problem with it. On the one hand, he says, I'm Joseph, whom you sold to Egypt, right? And then right after that, he goes, don't be angry with yourself, because God's actually the one who sent me here. No tension whatsoever. God is sovereign, and you did what you did. God's in control, and you did what you did. You sinned against me. God didn't have to make you something that you're not in order for you to do it yet. He's sovereign over it and in control of it. And those two things just rest. And he doesn't even feel like he needs to explain it. Because he doesn't. Because they're both true and God is God. Amen? But that's why your ability to forgive is rooted and grounded in your understanding of God's sovereignty. Because ultimately, what are you saying? I'm not going to forgive you. You know, somebody sins against me. A person sins against me, and I say I'm not going to forgive. Let's say that person over here. Over here we got a believer who sins against me, and over there we got an unbeliever who sins against me. All right? Over here I have a believer who sins against me, and I forget the sovereignty of God in all of this and the big picture of redemptive history. And he sins against me. Ultimately, if I don't forgive, there's several problems. Number one, I'm in sin because God commands me to forgive. There's a first problem. Secondly, I'm a hypocrite. Why? Because I'm not forgiving this person for sinning against me, right? And my not forgiving them is actually sinning against God. But I'm okay with it. Here's the other problem. If they're a believer and they sinned against me, their sin was nailed to the cross and forgiven and I am saying to Almighty God, the death of Jesus may be enough for you to forgive him, but I require more. It may be enough for you, but it's not enough for me. Well, I would never say that to God. Yes, every time you do not forgive a fellow believer, that's exactly what you're saying to God, whether you know it or not. That's what you're saying to God. 
The cross is not enough. They need the cross of Christ plus the silent treatment from me. That'll balance the scales. They need the cross of Christ plus me keeping the grandkids away from them. That'll make it okay. They need the cross of Christ plus me slapping them, plus me cussing them out. That'll make it okay. But the blood of Jesus itself, not enough. Well, how about the unbeliever that I don't forgive? Well, the unbeliever will go to hell and pay for his sin as the wrath of God is poured out against him for eternity. What are you saying when you don't forgive the unbeliever? The wrath of God is not enough. Over here, the blood of Jesus is not enough, and over here, the wrath of God is not enough. In other words, we're saying to God, God, you don't know how to punish sinners. You need my help. That whole hell thing, that's nothing compared to the angry eye from me. (laughs) You think hell is something? Wait until they try to talk to me, and I give them one of these. Yeah. See, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, people. And again, the absolute hypocrisy. It's hypocritical because you're fully expecting God to forgive you for your sin of not forgiving them. Why? Because my sins are small and other people's sins are big. And it's much more important to sin against me than it is to sin against God. Again, I would never say that. Yes, you do. Every time you're unforgiving, you say that. Sinning against me is much more important, much more significant than sinning against God. That's why I'm not willing to forgive. And when I sin, it's an accident. When other people sin, it's on purpose. I know this because I know their hearts. With me, it was a small thing, and I didn't mean it anyway. With them, it was huge, and they meant it. This is the way we look at other people's sin. And then we take it another step further. And here's the, this is a marriage killer, by the way. This is the marriage killer. Stop telling me you're sorry. Because if you were really sorry, you wouldn't do it anymore. Shall we, I don't know, put that under the magnifying glass of Scripture? If you were really sorry, then you wouldn't do it anymore. Okay, first of all, that whole 70 times 7 thing, Jesus is assuming that people are going to sin again and again and again and again and again in the same way. Secondly, the sins that you commit against God, they're not fresh new sins. They're the same sins over and over and over again. So you're a hypocrite again. Thirdly, if you were really sorry, you wouldn't do it. What you just said is you believe in sanctification by sorry. It's not Jesus that sanctifies you. It's being sorry enough. If you were sorry enough, you could overcome sin. Because God knows all we need to overcome sin is not the cross and the Son of God nailed to the cross. We just need to be sorry enough. That'll make you stop. Folks, that's crazy talk. But we do it, don't we? It's a marriage killer. It's a marriage killer. Why do I say it's a marriage killer? Because people who are married spend 20, 30, 40, 50 years committing many of the same sins against each other over and over and over again. And if you believe in sanctification by sorry, you will destroy your marriage. Because you'll convince yourself that your spouse doesn't have a sin problem like you do. They have a not sorry enough problem. God help us. God help us. Here's another myth that's exploded. The myth that says you can only forgive somebody if they ask for it. And ask for forgiveness. Really? Several problems with that. Remember, forgiving you means I choose not to make you pay. So if I can only forgive somebody when they ask me for forgiveness, then I also have to believe that I'm obligated to punish them until they ask. Now I'm the Holy Spirit. The other problem with that is you're saying that Joseph is being unbiblical here 
in the Bible. He forgave them before they even knew who he was. Forget asking for forgiveness. They didn't ask him for anything. He gave them forgiveness. They asked for nothing. Sounds almost like he's standing there saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Which is another person you got a problem with if you believe that lie. There's some of you here holding on to unforgiveness, being controlled by another person because you feel obligated to punish them. There's some of you being, you're being controlled by somebody who's been dead for years because you won't forgive a dead person because you feel like you still have to punish the memory of that person. God help us. Let that go. Forgive. You're commanded to. You're a hypocrite when you don't. You're blaspheming the blood of Christ if it was a believer, and you're blaspheming the wrath of God if it was an unbeliever. Let it go. Stop already. Forgive. Yes, but see, I have to continue to punish this person because otherwise they won't learn that they shouldn't. Oh, okay. So now you're punishing them with your anger so that your anger will produce righteousness. Huh. Sounds like there's a verse about that. Let me see. Maybe James, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The other problem with that, the other one is a marriage killer. Here's a parent-child killer. Pastor, if it's okay, I want to take just a few more minutes in this service, okay? Because last time we had y'all coming in here and all that sort of stuff. I'm going to take a few more minutes here because this is important stuff. Here's the parent-child killer, okay? The other one is the marriage killer. This is the parent-child killer. The parent-child killer is, I'm not going to forgive you. I'm going to continue to be angry with you because I want you to know how angry I am so that the next time you think about doing this, you won't do it because you think about my anger. Which means, I don't want you to run from sin because it displeases God, but because it makes me angry. In other words, I want you to commit idolatry. I want you to think about your sin in terms of what it does to me, your parent, not in terms of what it does to your heavenly father. And I want my anger to produce what the Bible says it can't produce, the righteousness of God. Please tell me you're hearing me, parents. I beg you, hear this. This is what we do to our children. Some of us, this is what we do to our spouses. And I got to be good and angry so that they'll think about this next time. So now we don't believe in sanctification by sorry. We believe in sanctification by fear. We see none of that here. Joseph goes on to tell them, God sent me here so that I could preserve a remnant and preserve you and your children. By the way, that is why he's there. He's there so that Judah will survive. The famine is coming. Think about this. The famine is coming. And Joseph, he, he gets this. There's this whole seed land covenant thing. And the famine is coming. We don't understand. Here's how you think about the difficulties in your life. Rather than, hold on, in the difficulties of your life, maybe God will exalt you and you'll become the second most powerful man in the world. That's not true. It's almost never true. It happened here, but not so that believers will understand that Joseph gives you power when people persecute, that God gives you power when people persecute you. Because it's not, it's not true. Folks, martyrdom is real. People die as martyrs. Does that mean they weren't faithful? No. This is not about Joseph's power. It is about God's providence. So here's what's happening. These people are in this land of promise, and God has made this promise about this land and about the seed and about the covenant. But there's a famine coming. If they stay where they are, they will die. The promised seed will not continue, and there will be no redeemer. So he's got to provide grain for them. 
they don't have silos. There's not enough of them to provide grain. Who can provide grain for the people of God in the midst of this seven-year famine? Egypt can. They've got enough land, they've got enough grain, and they've got enough silos. Egypt can provide for my people when this famine comes. How do you get Pharaoh to feed your people? He doesn't even know who these people are. There's just a few of them. Why is he going to feed these people? You pluck Joseph out. You put him in a pit. You bring him to Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house prospers because Joseph is there. Joseph is betrayed by Potiphar's wife. He goes to prison. The prison prospers while Joseph is there. By the way, he interprets dreams. You speak to Pharaoh through dreams, Pharaoh can't interpret them. But the cupbearer remembers this boy who was in prison, and the prison prospered. And in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's house prospered. He interprets the dream, which says you're going to need prosperity. Pharaoh puts him second in command so that Egypt will prosper. Not because God's in love with Egypt, but because Egypt's the only place with silos big enough so that the promised seed doesn't die and Judah and all his clan survive. That's the lesson. The lesson is God will bring about the redemption of his people regardless of human circumstances. That's the message. That's the message. The message is, even in your darkest days, remember two things. Number one, it's better than you deserve. I don't care how bad your circumstances are, it's better than you deserve. Here's the second thing. God is working out his redemptive plan. And if he crushed and killed his spotless, sinless son in order to bring glory to himself, you can go to Potiphar's house. You're not too good for that. You're not too good for that. What does this have to do to forgiveness? Do you know why I don't forgive people? They do something to me and my immediate thought is, I don't deserve what you did to me. You need to pay. If I see myself rightly, you sin against me, guess what I know? It's not nearly as bad as what I actually deserve. Besides that, what you did to me either was nailed to the cross or you're going to pay for it in hell. I don't need to punish you. I don't have the right to punish you. Sinning against me is not significant enough for you to deserve punishment. Besides that, me holding on to unforgiveness against you is like me drinking poison hoping you die. So I forgive you. Let me give you this last thing. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Because a lot of people, when they hear this, and they go, well, I'm supposed to act like it never happened. I'm supposed to act. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. It takes a while for relationships to be reconciled. It takes a while for, for relationships to be reconciled, for relationships to be brought back. I can forgive you all by myself. You don't even have to be here. You don't even have to know that I've forgiven you. Reconciliation is a two-way street. So for our relationship to be prepared, that takes both of us. For forgiveness to happen, that can be completely one-sided. There's a difference between the two. As a young man, I grew up without my father. My mother became pregnant with me when she was a 17-year-old senior in high school. When I was born, back in 1969, it's back in the day when people did the right thing and, you know, got married. And so my parents did the right thing and they got married for, like, that long. My dad was gone. My, my dad, he just wasn't there. I knew my father. I saw him from time to time, but he, he wasn't there. He didn't raise me but I never felt abandoned until. <sighs> 23 years ago, my oldest daughter was born. I'm standing there, I'm in the room and we're going through the whole deal 
You know, I mean, I'm there, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my deal. I'm doing my job. I'm working hard, you know. You know, <laughs> breathe, push. I mean, I got it down, you know. And, and, and you know, we, we do this and all this sort of stuff. And then, then there's my baby girl. There she is. And all these things are just flooding me. Just things that just come to I'm overwhelmed, you know. Firstly, I'm just like, clean her up, please, you know. <laughs> and, and then, you know, we cut the umbilical cord, and I'm the first person there holding this girl. And I'm, I'm crying. I'm, I'm crying for a number of reasons. One of the reasons I'm crying is because for the first time in my life, I felt abandoned. I never felt abandoned by my father until the day my daughter was born. Because I'm standing there and I'm holding this little girl and I think to myself, what on this earth could cause me to leave her? And I couldn't think of anything. And so I go, so how could my father leave me? How could he have this and then one day say, I'm out of here. And for the first time in my life, I felt abandoned. At that moment, it just crashed in on me. I, I just, I couldn't get it. I couldn't understand it. I, I'm just thinking, I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm like, I'll chew through this, that wall right there for this little girl if I had to. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. And I'm looking at my wife and I'm going, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. She ain't going nowhere either. Maybe she tried to leave me, I, you know, where are we going? <laughs> Several years later, my father is converted. And he starts to call me and he's still in California. I'm from Los Angeles and take the family back out and he meets my wife and children. I, I had two children before my father even met the woman who I was married to. Both of my children were born before he met any of our children. And so, but this relationship is there and it's being restored. And my father starts calling me and asking me these questions. And he starts, at one point, he starts calling me just several times a week asking me questions, and we're talking about Bible and theology and doctrine and all this sort of stuff. One day I'm coming out of my office, and my wife says to me, talking to pops, huh? And I said, yeah, how can you tell? She said, I can always tell when you get off the phone with your father. A couple of months later, I get a phone call. He's dead. He's gone. And it just floored me. And my precious wife says to me, isn't it awesome that God allowed you to disciple your father before he died? What if I hadn't forgiven him? What if I carried bitterness? And what if I said, you know what? He doesn't deserve to see his grandkids. He doesn't deserve to even have my phone number, let alone call me and ask me questions. Where was he when I needed questions answered? I want him to know what it feels like to want somebody in your life and not have them there. I need to be the one to make him feel that. What if that had been my response? Then I'd have spent every day from the day he died regretting not having taken advantage of every moment that we had. And not having had the privilege of discipling my dad before he died. question is, how do you not, how does a Christian not forgive when you know what you've been forgiven, 
when you know that God laid your sin upon his son and that he crushed him on the cross because of you and your sin and you continue to sin against God and he forgives you. How? How do you not forgive in light of that? How do you know how much you owe and not forgive? How? I believe that's why Jesus connects our forgiveness to our salvation. If you can't forgive other people, you can't understand the cross. How can you say you're a Christian and not forgive other people? How can you know that Christ died for your sin, that they were laid upon him and that he paid for them? And then he granted you his righteousness. And not for you other people. How can you look at someone and know that their sins have been nailed to the cross like yours and then not forgive them? How can you look at someone and know that their sins have not been nailed to the cross and that they bear them continually and that they will pay for them and experience the wrath of God for all eternity and not forgive them and beg God to forgive them in Christ? How can you do that? That's the question. Not how can you forgive somebody who does something terrible to you? How can you not? As a follower of Christ, how can you not? How can you know the gospel and not be affected in such a way that forgiveness becomes the norm? That's the question. Saints, if you're here today and you're holding on to unforgiveness, let it go. I beg you, I plead with you for your own sanity. Let it go. Let it go. You're warping your understanding of your relationship with God because you think that he thinks about you the same way you think about other people. You're unforgiving, so you think you serve a God who's unforgiving. Let that go. Repent. If you are here and you have not come to faith in Christ, my prayer for you is that you would find this forgiveness, that you would understand you owe a debt to God that you cannot pay. That you are a sinner in desperate need of a savior. And there is one. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. You need to know that. Sinner, you need to hear that. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. You need to know that today. You need to know that today. And if you're here outside of Christ, your greatest problem is not that you don't forgive others. Your greatest problem is that you haven't experienced forgiveness from God. You get that taken care of first. There's a beautiful picture here of forgiveness. And I thank God for it. But the only reason that it's beautiful is because it's seen in light of the glorious forgiveness that we have in Christ. Now we can finish Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, as God in Christ also forgave you. Let's pray. Father, we are overwhelmed by your goodness and overwhelmed by our sinfulness. Overwhelmed by our hypocrisy that we can stand forgiven for so much and yet hold on to unforgiveness toward others. Grant by your grace that we would embrace this truth and live in light of it. And for the one under the sound of my voice who has not come to repentance and faith, grant by your grace that they would see forgiveness today, receive forgiveness today, walk in forgiveness today. And grant that our lives would be marked by it. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Dr. Bauckham. What a wonderful message on forgiveness. We're going to have a moment of invitation. If God's speaking to you about needing forgiveness, respond. If he's needing you to show it, listen.